today, by request of the commissioner, we are doing a commission tutorial. I would like to thank Stephanie Chance so much for allowing me to record this and thank you again for commissioning me. So the materials you're going to need for this tutorial are a block of watercolor paper. Now a block of watercolor paper is watercolor paper that has already been stretched and it is sealed on at least two sides. Many are sealed on all four. I'm using fluid cold press watercolor paper in 8x8. Eight eight. You're going to want some sketchbook paper and you're going to want to go ahead and get a non-photo blue pencil. And you can check my description below for links to all these things. So the first thing I do when I'm doing a con commission is I go ahead and I trace the outline of the surface. That way I know how much space I have to work. The next thing I do is I go ahead and I pull up my reference and I'll be working with a photo and out of respect for my commissioner I'm not going to display the photo on camera. So we're just going to go ahead and zoom in and I complete that sketch with non-photo blue and she wanted a detailed chibi commission so it's a little more complicated than my dots for eyes and relies a little more heavily on that reference for accuracy so the first thing I do is I'm going to figure out my space and I apologize that it's a little difficult to see. Sometimes it's hard for the camera to pick up the non-photo blue. Hopefully though, as we build up our form and figure, you guys will be able to see it. So I'm starting with a circle for the head and I'm blocking in with a rectangle for the body. And this was a commission taken while at MechaCon in New Orleans, Louisiana, which is where I'm from back in late June, no, July, sorry. So I am blocking out the figure and for now I'm using sticks for arms and legs just to sort of get the pose figured out. And because I happen to prefer mechanical pencils, I'm using a mechanical pencil with that non-photo blue lead in it. But if you like wooden pencils, there are plenty of excellent non-photo blue wood pencils on the market, um, including cold erase pencils, which are a favorite of many animators. And we're blocking in the skirt. And you can see we use cylinders and wedges to block in the legs and the feet. to continue to use cylinders to block in the arms and for the style I draw chibis in I draw the lower forearm larger than the upper forearm so that I can do these really cute big hands and I feel like the large hands and the large feet sort of balance out the large head of, for the chibi style so um, you know it is an aesthetic that I think works. And don't feel bad if you can't knock them out as quickly as I can. Um, this is the result of many, 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 many years of practice. And I promise if you do it regularly, you'll get much faster at it. Any skill you want to learn, you're going to have to put the time in. And it's okay to be not so great at first. Please don't compare yourself to people who have been doing it for much, much longer because it's just going to make you sad. You should compare yourself to where you were the day before and as long as you're learning new things and making progress, that's, that's great. I'm currently using a Uni Kura Toga. Um, it's a very popular mechanical pencil, but I actually just like it because the way this thing works, the selling point, is it rotates your lead every time you press the lead down on the paper. So you always have a sharp point. I find it makes it feel like my lead is always sliding on the paper and I feel like it makes it more difficult to use. So it is not a favorite of mine. So please do not assume that using it is a recommendation. I recommend you experiment around and find something that works well for you. Sorry. So I have recorded detailed chibi videos before and we've talked about the importance of capturing a likeness. Um, I always feel like this is true when I do con commissions, especially when people are purchasing a portrait. I want it to look like them, but in this particular art style. So um, I always try to figure out what their defining characteristics are. And the girl I'm drawing has kind of a cupid's bow mouth, so I wanted to make sure I got that. And 
and she has a face that actually lends itself really well for this style. So this is a fun commission for me. If I could just get my pencil to behave appropriately. So, um, I don't know if you guys picked up on this, but I draw all of the major shapes before I refine anything. So, you know, I've drawn the gesture for the arms before I start drawing the arms themselves. I draw a gesture of the hand before I start drawing the hands themselves. Um, drawing is really about seeing things as a series of shapes and then progressively breaking them down as you add more detail. So you see how the skirt right now is mostly just a trapezoid and I've drawn three lines on it. Now we're going to break it up into ruffled tiers. And ruffles are really easy for the most part. They are just sort of like a squiggly line. And later on, when we transfer this, we're going to add a lot more detail to it. There's no point in adding too, too much detail at this stage. Um, you're just going to kind of wear your hand out. And she has wavy hair. So think of wavy hair like a series of S's. Pencil lit is starting to run out. Now, if I'm drawing someone who's wearing wearing glasses, I like to draw the features of the face first before I start drawing in the gesture of the glasses. I feel like it's easier to draw the glasses around the, the features of the face than it is to try to draw the glasses first and then draw the face underneath them. It's easier to get everything lined up. I mean, if you make a mistake, it is true, you may be erasing more, you may have to redraw more, but um, it should, I feel like this is just an easier method, and I don't have to erase too often when I use this method. All right, so we've got our basic blue line sketch here. The next thing you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna take a pair of scissors, and you're gonna wanna go ahead and cut it out. All right, guys, next we're gonna do a graphite transfer. For this stage, you're going to need your image with the blue lines, a graphite stick, preferably a softer graphite, something in the Bs, this is a B6 graphite stick, and I left the wrapper on because it makes it easier um, and cleaner for my hands. You're also going to want a comfortable to hold uh, pencil. This is a mechanical pencil. It's a pretty inexpensive one. I picked it up at Walmart. It's a Pintel side effect. This works just fine. Um, you're gonna want a harder lead rather than a softer lead because you're using the lead to transfer your image onto the next thing you're going to need, your watercolor paper. For this part, we're actually gonna use the chipboard back and we're gonna go ahead and cover the back of the entire image with graphite. So I'll check in with you guys after this has been covered. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our graphite transfer, which has still not been transferred yet, and we're gonna go ahead and place it on our watercolor paper. All right, so once you have it where you want it, and you wanna be gentle about moving it around because you will brush some of the graphite off if you're not, you wanna go ahead and tape it down. And you want to use a lightweight, low-tack tape. So painter's tape is good, masking tape is good. You don't want anything permanent like scotch tape or certainly not um, uh, duct tape. You can use washi tape because we're going to be removing this after we've gone ahead and transferred the whole image. So after you've applied tape all the way around, you'll be ready to transfer and I'll check in with you guys then. Now that we have our entire image transferred, we're gonna go ahead and grab that mechanical pencil with the harder lead in it. And we're gonna start actually going over our image. And this should transfer the illustration because you're pressing down on it. It's going to press the graphite down into the watercolor paper. So that'll transfer the image.
briefly a moment ago about drawing ruffles. We're gonna go back into them in some detail. The way I draw ruffles is I've already got my, my basic sketch for them down. So I'm gonna draw all of the sort of little indents where the fabric goes in first, and then I'm going to connect the whole series of ruff ruffles together. And I find that this is an easy way to draw ruffles that reads well for simpl simplified styles like this one here. entire image has been copied over. I guess you could say traced, um, but it is your original image. So, um, you know, I try to avoid saying trace since it does have so many negative connotations. You want to go ahead and carefully, because you can tear the paper, carefully remove your um, tape. And it's okay if you tear the image because this is not what's important anymore. Um, you just don't want to tear your watercolor paper. And I went ahead and I taped down the sides since this is an older block of watercolor paper. And with fluid blocks, often the last few pieces of paper can kind of come loose from uh, the glue binding on two of the sides because these are only bound on two sides. So I go ahead and I tape it down or I use bulldog clips to go ahead and um, secure it so I don't get too much warping. All right, there we go. That's our image, isn't that cool? Um, and we're going to tighten a lot of it up while we paint, but it's a pretty good transfer. So the materials you're going to need for the next step are going to be a glass of clean water, a nice large watercolor brush. This is a round, you can use synthetic for this sort of thing. And I'm going to go ahead and use some of my brush-o powders for this since I love the way they look for backgrounds. Um, you guys have probably seen me use these in other videos and I have quite a few tutorials with them. I really do enjoy using them. I hope, um, if you haven't yet, I hope I can inspire y'all to give them a shot. And the, the, color, the, the company that makes these is not a sponsor by any means. I just think these are a lot of fun and I'd love to see more artists uh, give them a shot. And I was gonna do black and gold, um, but thinking about it, that this was a commission taken in New Orleans and black and gold is the colors of the saints. I hate the saints, I'm sorry. If the commissioner loves them, but I hate them because um, I lived in New Orleans and when they won or when they went to the Super Bowl, like there were gunshots in my neighborhood because people were celebrating. So I'm gonna switch that out rather than give them some free promotion and go with a lovely cobalt blue. And if you guys hang around this channel long enough, you will find out my hatred for football is like crazy deep. Really can't stand football. All right, so I'll check out. I will come back in a couple of minutes when we're ready to apply our brush out. Right, for this next step, you're gonna wanna also have, I should have mentioned this sooner, a clear wax crayon. Um, for this particular tutorial, it doesn't have to be clear. You can use white because we're gonna be putting it on, on top of the white watercolor paper. And what you're gonna do, if you wanna do your commissions the way I do my commissions, but I really, really, really would like you to do your own. Um, just use this as inspiration, please. This is my bread and butter. I sell these at conventions, so, you know, help me out. Um, if, you, if, you try, if you're playing along at home, we're gonna go over the outline. So we're gonna create a difference between the background, which is gonna be brush out, and the foreground, which is gonna be watercolor. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that off camera because you're not gonna be able to see it anyway. All right, guys, so we're gonna take that large round brush and we're gonna go ahead and saturate the watercolor paper around the figure. Um, and the wax crayon we just put on creates this area of resist between the foreground and the background. So um, in prior tutorials, you guys may have seen me before I started utilizing this technique and sometimes the brush I would get on the figure and you know we'd spend a lot of time figuring out ways to sort of marry the two together. And while those do end up turning out quite nice, this is a little bit easier and it also tends to make for a more graphic pop of color. Um, so I think it just makes for more fun commissions. 
So we're saturating the paper and you want the paper to still be kind of actively pooled. You don't want it to just be damp. You want it to be wet because that way the brusho can, has room to be activated. Now we're gonna start with the cobalt blue and we're just gonna go ahead and sprinkle it on there. And I'm not really concerned about it getting on the figure at this point. Sprinkle some of that black in there. And I'm working on my Ink Essentials craft sheet. Again, they're not a sponsor. I just happen to really like it. It makes cleanup very easy. It is a fabric sheet that is impregnated with um, silicon or silicone. One of the two, dang it. Uh, and it just cleans off very easy. Nothing really sticks to it. All right, so if you have any pooled areas, you can use a paper towel to go ahead and clean that up. And that's really simple. You just dip a corner of your paper towel into your wet spots and it'll absorb some of the excess water. If you allow brush to pool too, too much, you're gonna lose a lot of this sort of color burst that we've got going on. And that's a slightly better view. Um, my phone was in the way. I was capturing a quick little time lapse to share to my Instagram. If you guys like my art, you wanna head on over there. It's often a sneak peek of what I'm working on for the YouTube channel and the blog. So, just absorbing that extra water. Now, because the water was applied so thickly, it's gonna take a lot longer to dry. So you wanna give it at least an hour. Um, sometimes it takes even longer than that. Sometimes I let it dry the entire day because you want it entirely dry before you progress on to the next step. All right, guys, once the background's dry and you've brushed off the brush -o, you're going to want to go ahead and, uh, actually I haven't brushed off the brush -o, so let me go do that. You can use, in fact, I recommend you use either a feather brush or a drafting brush like this to brush off your excess brush -o, and I recommend you do it over a trash can because this stuff gets everywhere and once it get, gets wet, it can stain. After you've removed your excess brush -o, go ahead and seal the, what's remaining on there by adding water and uh, dabbing away any excess color with a paper towel. And yes, this will activate your brush out, but it prevents it from mixing when you apply your paint. So let's say you go ahead and you put down your skin tone. Um, if you, if it hits brush out and it's blue or black like this background, it's going to wreck your skin tone pretty much regardless of what skin tone you're putting down. So it's really better if you go ahead and activate it because once it's been activated, it's not going to um, be as problematic. And you'll also know what you're dealing with, so it makes it easier to sort of uh, adjust your colors if you need to. Next, we're gonna take a paper towel. You're gonna go ahead and soak up that extra water. That will shorten the dry time on her skin. It'll also suck up some of that color going to allow that to dry fully before we start in on the skin tones. So the first thing we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to mix up our skin tones and you know that's not really the first thing you want to do now that I think about it. You want to go ahead and activate your watercolors and I'm doing that by spritzing some water on them and this means they're going to perform more consistently because um, they've sort of been pre-activated. And I'm going to put a little bit of water. Let's zoom out just a little bit. Little bit of water in one of these plastic well palettes. And you can get these all over the place from Walmart to art stores to Amazon. They're really not hard to find at all. And I'll put a link to where you can get some on Amazon in the description. So for skin tones, I like to use, especially Caucasian skin tones, I like to use this yellow ochre color along with some scarlet up there that is the lighter of the two reds in this little 12 piece set. And I complete my convention watercolors with Sakura Koi's little 12 piece uh, field sketching set. And they do make larger sets. It's really a matter of personal preference. I don't really need more colors than this little set for most of my con commissions. Gonna grab a slightly smaller brush. And these brushes that come to a point like this are called rounds. 
and I'm going to go ahead and begin by filling in the first layer of her skin. And watercolor is really an exercise in patience. So we're going to do a lot of layers and then we're going to spend a lot of time waiting for those layers to dry. Can you see how this little bit of blue became activated? Can you go ahead and dab that up? In fact, you're going to want to dab that up, especially if it is on the face, because humans are most attuned to recognizing discrepancies in the face. So that's going to be the area where if there's a problem, people are going to immediately pick it, pick it out. It's also the area that tends to create the most likeness for most people the most recognizable features. So you wanna make sure the face looks as accurate as possible and has as few mistakes as possible. All right, we're going to go ahead and sort of just pick up any excess water to prevent it from pooling. And you do that pretty simply. You just glide your brush over it and then dab it off onto your paper towel. And we're gonna let this dry before we move on to the next layer. Once your first layer of skin is dried, if you have someone wearing glasses, now is a good time to go ahead and fill in the glass on the glasses. And what I like to do with that is I like to mix a little bit of indigo um, and that'll sort of give the effect like, you know, like there's glass in glasses. And it's just a light glaze over the color you've already put down. Of course, you are gonna have to allow that to dry. And then, as per specifications, it looks like the skirt she's wearing is a very light purple. So we're mixing a little bit of the indigo with a little bit of a sort of red violet. And with watercolor, you do wanna keep in mind that whatever you put down, it's gonna end up drying lighter later on. So this is gonna be even lighter after it dries. While we're here, we might as well go ahead and mix up our hair color. And it is a dark brown with some light brown highlights. So for that, we really wanna start with a light brown um, or even like a golden brown. And to get a golden brown, you mix some yellow ochre here with some of the burnt sienna next to it. And we'll go ahead and knock in those highlights. Using very fluid brush strokes. Letting the brush do most of the work. So, for that, you're gonna want your workspace to be mostly clean to give you room to move your arm. Now, um, my drafting table does also serve as my computer desk, so I don't have quite as much work, uh, room to work, but I really recommend that you guys, if you can, find an area with lots of space. All right, and then we're gonna let all of this dry. So once the wet layers have dried, you can begin working again. One of the big mistakes I see people who are unfamiliar with watercolors as a medium is they try to work way too soon. And you might be able to work with oils or, uh, you know, of course you work with oils while they're still wet. And um, you do do some work with acrylics while they're still wet. And with watercolor you can, but that tends to be the big problem that most people have is um, they try to go into an area that was wet and it gets muddy really quickly on them. You really only wanna go wet into wet when you want blending. And um, sometimes the blending will completely obliterate your prior layer. So you really do wanna be careful with your wet into wet techniques, especially towards the end of a piece. Too much water um, in the final stages of your watercolor, be it a little simple um, convention style watercolor like this or something much more elaborate like your watercolor pages, if that's what you're choosing to do, um, you, you really, need to be careful with your wet to wet techniques towards the end. So right now I'm going in with the, seem, I think it's a bird sienna. Um, you know, these were labeled a long time ago and I've since discarded the packaging. And you don't necessarily wanna work directly from the pan. So I am mixing a little bit of water in 
and sort of just mixing it in that palette with my brush. Not a whole lot, we're not using a whole well. We're just doing enough to ensure that there's like a good distribution of color and water on the brush itself. And uh, you might actually want to work with a slightly smaller brush than this. In general though, you do want to work with as large a brush as you're comfortable using for the technique you're using it. And feel free to twist and turn your um, canvas as often as you need to. It's really about getting the angle that you're comfortable with painting in. I'm always kind of puzzled by um, artists on like YouTube who are able to work with only without moving their canvas at all. Um, that would wreck my wrist. And you want to be careful if you need to rest your hand on the background, which is what I'm doing right over here. Um, especially if you used brusho, because your hand can pick that up. So you want to be careful about not transferring it onto other pieces of your image. zoom in so you guys can I know it's sort of the last bit on that particular piece of hair but so that you guys can at least see and you want to clean your brush out really well after you use colors like that because they tend to get way up in the ferrule of your brush that's this metal part and can affect how your subsequent layers can look. So I'm adding a little bit of shade here to the skirt. I'm gonna blend some of it out with water so it's not such a harsh line. And like with the hair, I'm gonna let it dry. Okay, so once your hair is dried, you can go back to working on the skin. Or if you wanted, you could work on the skin all in one go. I do try when I can to sort of um, break things up by what areas of the paper are dry. It means that I can often um, work in a shorter period of time than if I worked on everything one piece at a time. And as you see down here, we activated... Oh, now I guess you can't see down there. All right, we did activate a little bit of that brush up. So we're gonna go ahead, dab that back up. Now, when I'm at this stage of glazing and layering, I want to start leaving in my highlights, and those are for things like skin, the area that is closest to the light. So that's why I went ahead and I filled in all her legs, but I'm going to leave like the tops of her hands light to simulate light hitting them. And I think one of the most important things in a, a good watercolor. Um, a good watercolor illustration, especially for comics, is like high contrast because the contrast makes it easier to read it. At a distance, it's easier for your eye to parse what's going on. So even in my convention watercolors, like this one here, I do try to introduce contrast. And that means we may need to go ahead and mix this color a little bit darker. Now I'm gonna go ahead with that clean paper towel and sponge up some of the paint that's on her forehead since the light would hit that. And we're also gonna go ahead and absorb any of the paint that's sort of pulled. All right, and I'm also gonna go ahead and mix that color a little bit darker. So more yellow ochre, more scarlet. And then we also wanna think about the color we're gonna to use to blush the cheeks. So over here in the middle well, that you guys cannot see, I'm mixing a little bit of that scarlet with a little bit of that red violet. And when this layer of skin is dried, I can go ahead and apply that and it'll be ready for me. And you may have noticed that I didn't color the area inside of the glasses. Let me zoom in. So um, 
That is to imply that there is glass there. We are going to color her eyes. It's not like they're getting left out. Um, I'm just going to apply fewer layers underneath the glass than I would otherwise. That way, you know, there's that sort of frosted look of like maybe the reflection catching the glass. Okay, so now that the skin has had a chance to dry, we're gonna go ahead and put in that blush. And I've mentioned this in other videos, but your paint will dry lighter than you put it down. You can still blend it out though with some clean water. If the color is a little too intense or you want um, just like a, a cleaner blend. And I put blush on the knees and above the eyes, so right underneath the eyebrows, the lips, of course, the pads of the hand, underneath the neck, tips of the toes. Heel. So basically anywhere it looks sort of cute or where you have a bending joint or where there's skin overlapping skin is going to be a place where I'll put blush. And that's for male and female characters as long as they're in this particular style. And we'll go ahead and start mixing. For the hair. Now her hair is very dark brown and in a limited set like this you don't have a dark brown. So what I do is I thickly mix the brown sienna with some black and I add more black as the hair gets darker. Right. And we're going to need to go darker for the next layer. Alright, so here we are testing out the new darker color we've mixed up for skin. And I'll go ahead and zoom in so you guys can see what I'm doing. And basically, when you're painting watercolor skin like this in a cartoony way, you want every layer to cover less than the layer did before. That's how you can go about leaving highlights. So see, we've left larger patches of the face not painted. On her legs here, we're gonna start leaving some areas unpainted as well. Then on her skirt, we're gonna go ahead and go down to a smaller size brush. Knock in some more shadows and then blend some of them out because they are a little harsh. Alright, so after your skin has dried, you can opt to keep working on that blush or not. You know, it's really up to you. Um, it's really a matter of taste and the dictates of the particular commission you're working on. I am going to darken up a few areas. Just to give you guys some context, because so many of you do tell me that you'd love to learn how to paint, but you're just not patient enough for it. While working on this piece, I scanned several watercolor illustrations. I um, sort of curated my portfolio for an upcoming conference. And what else did I do? I know I did some other stuff too. Well, I did a, a character design for... Um, a double page spread illustration I'm working on. Worked out on a blog post. So, um, you know, it helps to have other things going on 
while you're watercoloring so you're not just waiting on paint to dry. There's going to be plenty of that anyway. And usually, if I'm not recording and I'm painting, I'm watching some TV or something while doing all those other things. So um, I definitely don't feel bored while I'm working. Alright, I'll see you guys when this layer has dried. Alright guys, so another day and another evening has passed. Um, it is taking me a little bit longer with this one than it would normally take. that is I actually tend to do more detail when I am recording tutorials for you guys and part of it is also that the detailed chibi commissions do tend to take longer than dots for eyes and the brush out background also adds another 24 hour dry period because I want to make sure it's absolutely dry before I start applying color on top of it Uh, is all right because I think the end result looks a lot better. And she specified that she wanted gold sandals so I'm going to go ahead and mix the warm yellow with the yellow ochre. That'll give me a nice goldish color. And I also thought I would go over that with some gold ink. I do like using um, iridescence and metallics with commissions since these are some these are things that are going up on someone's wall rather than something they're experiencing in a book. So, you know, makes for a more interactive experience. I don't like using um, iridescence for reproduction work because it never turns out quite like quite like it looks in person. I switch to a smaller watercolor brush to go ahead and lightly feather in her eyebrows. I'm going to use that same brush to add a little bit of definition to her lips, not a whole lot. And once this layer dries, I can go ahead and start filling in her, uh, her shirt. I do want to go back, though, to her glasses, and I want to add a little bit of shadow to the eyes. Let me zoom way in for you guys. And I do that pretty simply by just adding some darker blue to the top half of the eyes. Bit as well to where the glasses would be kept casting a slight shadow on the face and I'm also gonna just go ahead and lightly blend that out just a little bit and now that the first layer of the shoes is dried I'm gonna go back in with yellow ochre and just add a little bit of shadow the gold ink's gonna end up covering a lot of that. So I don't wanna put too much detail in. That's gonna end up getting lost. And then I'm gonna go into the burnt sienna and go ahead and color in the soles of her shoes. And come back to this when it's dry. You can definitely tell which of these colors I use often and which seldom see use because the ones that I often use are all rutted out and the ones that are barely used, well, they look barely used. I don't try to force myself to completely use a set. When certain colors have become difficult to use, I just go ahead and switch the whole thing out. Dear Chief 
enough that I definitely feel like I got my money's worth out of them. Maybe if I was using one of the large sets, I would not be, um, sorry about that. I would not be willing to uh, do it that way. But the little 12 piece set is both inexpensive and small, so it's not really a big deal to toss one or two colors. Certainly, certainly the white. I pretty much never use the white. I use white wash instead. <clears throat> And we'll talk about that in a little while. Adding some of that brown-black mixture to the shoe. Okay, so at this stage of the program, I like to start outlining what I can. And to do that, I mix the skin tone a little bit darker than it was originally. So I also use it to knock in additional shadows where they're necessary. So, you know, around the glasses. And after this layer dries, I'm gonna go ahead and um, ink the glasses as well. Well, really watercolor, but it's basically inking. To do that, I really just use a fine watercolor brush. And I go over my pencil lines. And it sort of just tightens up the illustration a little bit more. And also knock in additional shadows where they're necessary. we can start adding some of the more fun details, like the white wash, or the gold paint, or even an iridescent medium. So, with this sort of gold paint, this is a water-based gold paint, and you want to shake it up really well before you use it, because it has little bitty particles in it. And of my gold, of gold paints, it is one of my favorites. Um, partially because the color is really nice, but also it's just fun to play around with. And it is water soluble, and it will remain so even after it's dry. It never becomes fully permanent. So, um, if you want it to go all over your painting, apply it first, and it'll give like a really nice warm goldish wash to what you've just done. Or you can wait till the end, like I did, to use it to add just a little bit of gold highlight to things. Now, with the iridescent, this is fine tech, and they tend to be on the pricey side, but I think they're worth it. Um, you can get some Yasumoto um, iridescent watercolors as well, although I am not familiar with those, so I don't know how well they perform. The Yasumoto ones are much, much cheaper than the fine tech ones, though, so they're good if you just want to play around a little bit. Um, you can also get Twinkling H2Os. Um, those are more metallic, though, than iridescent. There aren't multiple colors. so much as it's like flecks of, of mica in the color of the paint inside. Added just a little bit of iridescence to the glasses. And we're going to add just a little bit of iridescence as well to the skirt. And that'll maybe be a fun surprise when it hits the light. bit of rose gold. And we need to wait for that to dry, but we can go ahead and put a little bit of white wash in one of these wells. 
And gouache is like an opaque watercolor. Some people paint with it entirely. Um, I have a hard time using it. I have a hard time thinking opaquely, if that makes sense. Um, so I have a difficulty with acrylics and I have difficulty with uh, gouache as its own medium. But if I'm using it to add details, white highlights on the gold sandals, I should be fine. gold splatters in the background just to sort of tie the gold in a little bit better. I wanted to thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today and helping me paint. Thank you so much for hanging out and keeping me company. Um, I really appreciate it when you guys do spend time with me. It's always great to, to be able to chat with y'all. I hope you guys have a great day. Um, if you enjoyed this video, please take a moment to um, leave a like and consider subscribing for more content like this. I post twice a week, so there's always something new to see. Um, if you have any questions about the materials used in this tutorial, or if you're interested in getting a um, commission of your own, you can leave me a comment and we can start talking about how to make that happen. If you enjoy videos like this and you'd like to help make more happen, head on over to my Patreon for information on how to join the community and the sort of rewards that, you know, community members have access to. And uh, if you really enjoy watercolor, please head on over to the blog and uh, check out my ongoing watercolor basics series. It's designed to get people painting. So, I'm Becca Hilburn. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today in my studio. I hope I get to see you guys again really soon. Y'all have a good day. Bye!